This is Freedom Investor Radio, and I'm John Pearl. It hit me like a freight train when I realized there was a better way. When I discovered that I could take my future into my own hands. When I realized I could invest my way to freedom. This is what I'm working towards. In each episode of Freedom Investor Radio, we will explore the tactics and strategies used by the top real estate investors and entrepreneurs in the nation. We will learn how you can start investing your way to freedom and take control of your life. Thanks so much for tuning in. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Freedom Investor Radio. I'm your host, John Pearl. And today I am going to be sharing an episode or an interview that I did with a buddy of mine, Hans, who is the host of the Path to Wealth podcast. We cover a lot of topics, everything from personal development to investing in real estate, even cover a little bit about working in the nuclear industry. So hope you guys enjoy. Take care. Talk to you soon. So kind of a long-term play, plenty of time. But really, it was just about getting educated financially, learning the difference between assets and liabilities, and trying to spend my money on things that will generate me more money as opposed to things that will give me monthly expense. Welcome to The Path to Wealth, the show about well-being, fulfillment, and financial freedom. And I'm your host, Hannes Henschi. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Path to Wealth. Today we have John Pearl from Freedom Investor. He's going to tell us all about the mindset it takes to take down your first GP deal and what it took him to transition into the freedom and the powerful or the power of real estate. Welcome to the show, John. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here and excited to chat. Yeah, I always like to start with your personal journey. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about where you're coming from and then we take it to your money mindset and where that came from. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd like to start off just real quick. I grew up in an upper middle class family, I would say. My parents, I I never really thought about money, never had to worry about it. But, you know, what that kind of did for me was it didn't really set me up for success later on in life. Once I was out on my own, I never really thought about how I was going to make, accumulate, protect generate wealth. But once I got to college, I just spent frivolously on unnecessary things. I got a credit card. I was racking up credit card debt. I had student loans that came due once I graduated. And that was really the eye opener for me as far as money goes. That was the first time when I was really in charge. Oh, I have to pay these debts off. I have credit collectors. I have debt collectors calling me. I was unemployed for a while right after I graduated. And at the time, I was living with my then girlfriend, now wife, who was footing all the bills for everything. But it was the worst feeling in the world, having debts to be paid and not being able to pay them. So that left a very strong lasting impression on me and my mindset. So I was 50k in the hole with student loan debts, which I know lots of folks graduate with more than that. That's a significant chunk of money, regardless. And I was unemployed for about a year. And so once I got my job, I currently work at a nuclear power plant. I've been there for the past decade. Once I got that job and started making some money, I wanted to aggressively attack this debt. I hated the feeling. I wanted to ask my girlfriend to marry me at the time, but I didn't want to do it with all this debt. I wanted to get that paid off. So I ended up paying that off in about a year and a half, aggressively buying my lifestyle, eliminating all the expenses I don't need and just living a very bare bones life. And once I got out of debt, then I started taking all that money and investing it into the 401k. Uh, I had a a Roth IRA as well, started playing around with some stocks. And ultimately, I discovered real estate. And right around the same time that I started getting into real estate investing and learning about it, I learned that the power plant that I work at would be shutting down in 2025. Right around the same time, I made this plan as I was learning about real estate investing, as I'm meeting more real estate investors and learning what type of lifestyle investing in real estate can afford you, I made it my mission to replace my W-2 income, my income from my job, 
with income from real estate investments over the course between 2018 when I found out that the power plant was closing and 2025 when it would close. So a long-term play, plenty of time, but really it was just about getting educated financially, learning the difference between assets and liabilities and trying to spend my money on things that will generate me more money as opposed to things that will give me monthly expenses. So that was my journey to where I'm at now with the money mindset. So did you feel comfortable to eventually make the proposal for the wedding? Yeah, I did. Once once I got the once I got the debts paid off, we uh, saved up and got a ring and no, nothing too fancy because I'm already in this mindset of spend money on the things that matter. She said, yes, of course. And we got <laughs> married. We had a very simple wedding, just immediate close family and friends. We paid for the whole thing and it's been great. It's been a great journey so far. Yeah. I actually think it's a valuable lesson to have that relationship, at least with the bad debt early on and have that aha moment because I, I had a similar, it wasn't student debt, it was my first investment in the business, but it was that really aha moment where, okay, I don't want to have that in, yeah. in, the, in that way again. Yeah, yeah, it's powerful. It's left a lasting impression. I never want to feel that again. Yeah. So why are they shutting down the power plant? Is that because it's been in service for so long or? So yeah, that's funny you should ask because actually yesterday, so this has been a very controversial topic in the state of California for the last five years or so, much longer than that, ever since the power plant came into operation in the 1980s, yeah. nuclear power is a very controversial topic. And yesterday, they, the state legislators agreed to extend the life of the plant for another five years. So now it's going to 2030. And the main reason for that is because the state doesn't have the renewable energy replacements that they thought they would have, or they're not on track to have that, that yeah. was going to replace the nuclear power, the clean energy that the nuclear power plant produces. Yeah. That, that doesn't change my plan, though. I'm yeah, 36 here's the right figure. Now. John is not yeah. going to be there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm 36 now. This just extends. It gives me more of a buffer, but... I still need to, I'm still going to need to find another way to pay my bills and pay for my living expenses outside of the power plant before, before I'm at retirement age, the traditional retirement age. Yeah. I'm still gunning for this goal that I have staying on track by 2025. That's awesome. And that's before you're 40, if I just did that right. Yeah. Away. Yeah. You're cutting the average retirement by almost 30 years right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think of it as retirement by any means. I'm not just looking yeah. to kick my feet up and relax. What I've learned about real estate investing is there's so many different ways you can do it and you can just make it a lifestyle. It's not about doing nothing for the rest of my life and just having all this money come in. It's about having the control and the freedom to work where I want to work, the location freedom to work when I want to work, the time freedom, and of course, the financial freedom to have what I'm doing cover my living expenses. So yeah, yeah. that's why I'm doing it. Yeah, I don't have a single person in my network that actually just started laying on the beach drinking margaritas once they reached it. It's all of us have bigger goals. And I think the industry is a very giving and community oriented industry. So mo there, there's nobody who doesn't go out and say, Hey, where can I have a bigger impact? Everybody is. Yeah. I don't really see people retiring at the beach and I don't think that's where anybody would like to be in the long term. Yeah. For a lot of the more successful folks who are much further down the path than me, the folks that I've talked to like that, they say they, they tried that route. They go once they reach their, their number, once they have enough income coming in that they can do whatever they want, essentially. Maybe they'll travel the world, they'll lay on the beach for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, and that gets old really quick. They find, you know, I was just talking to a gentleman yesterday, finds that he wants to get back into the business that he loves and that he's built and he wants to create more impact and help more people get involved. And that's one of the main reasons I love commercial real estate because it's a team sport and you can get yeah. more people involved and help other folks bring their money into these amazing investments. So, so yeah, it's, a, it's not about kicking my feet up and relaxing. It's just about freedom and control. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I, I love that. So what is, what is it like to work in a power plant? I do know one other real estate syndicator who also works in a power plant in North Carolina, Ben, okay. shout out. And it's always very interesting to me because people in Germany too, we shut down most of our power plants, the nuclear ones, which, which put us in a pickle right now. 
in terms of en energy supply, but it's been very controversial and we shut down some of them before they ever got on the network. It was crazy. You build them and you never put them live because of, but anyway, so you have like firsthand insights into the security level of them and yeah, they're safe. <laughs> yeah, it is absolutely safe. It's clean. The amount of waste that is produced is extremely minimal. That's not really my side of the house, but I can just tell you from working in a nuclear plant for a decade, it's safety is always at the forefront of everybody's mind and everything we do all the way down to using the handrails when you're walking up the steps or staying in the designated pathway that is the yellow markers on the ground when you're walking through the parking lot. And the reason for that is because everything we do in the nuclear industry, there's just a much bigger potential for catastrophic failure, the, you know, the higher up you go. So safety is always at the forefront of everything we do. We practice it from those basic principles of being safe just while you're walking up steps or walking through the parking lot all the way up to higher level activities that the others are performing when they're doing maintenance on the reactors. So it's safety is always first and foremost out there. And it's, it's highly safe, highly regulated. There's all these procedures that we have to follow for everything that we do. And the level of radiation that one would absorb in their bodies is lower on a daily basis than if you were to go spend a day on the beach, the radiation that you would receive from the sun. So it's, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about nuclear yeah. and I'm not the guy to, to educate folks on the cost or the, the benefits of nuclear power, but I can tell you that it's a highly regulated and safe environment to operate. You don't want to sit at the table with Elon Musk eating the radiated food that he was speaking about <laughs> in Japan. I didn't hear that one, but yeah, but yeah, as far as the level of dose you get on a day-to-day -day basis, it's generally none. Yeah, that's good to know. And uh, yeah, taking it back to your personal journey. So where did your money savviness come from? Is it something that simply because you weren't deaf and you had that aha moment or was there an individual, a mentor, a parent in your life that really planted the seed and was like, hey, this is the route to go? Yeah, it's a number of factors. It was it's mostly, so my brother is a financial advisor, a traditional financial advisor. And while I don't choose to invest my money that way, he has a lot of very good sound money principles that he helped me realize when I was in debt, strategies to pay off the highest straight credit cards or loans first, and then the saving to invest. The concept of financial literacy for me came just over the course of multiple years and throughout that journey. I'm constantly reading books about the topic, listening to podcasts. Once I discovered podcasts, I pretty much just stopped listening to music all together, yeah. not all together. The majority of my time spent in the car driving to and from work, I'm listening to audiobooks or podcasts just because I became so fascinated with financial independence and the concept of building something where I can control what I'm doing. But yeah, it's been a constant journey. Many people in my network getting out to conferences, meeting folks who are doing it. It's all a big like totality of all the learning that I've done has brought me to this point where I'm not even interested in spending my money on things that don't matter on the, the coolest car that I can get. It's more just about getting me closer to that financial freedom number that I have and not spending on things that don't bring me closer to that. Yeah, I would say that's a very healthy obsession. All of that from reducing the time you spend listening to music, even though I love music very much like you, like whenever I have some time or a space, I pop in a podcast and stuff and I love it. And I'm obsessed with freedom the way you are in like, what does it matter to me to have that level of car if I can just be free first? Right. Like yeah. I mean, free, it's, it's freedom kind of has like priority a, to me. Yeah, exactly. You can get there eventually. You got to prioritize, you know, what's more important. Do you want to be stuck? If you buy that car, then you're stuck working at this job so you can pay for it versus if you can just be disciplined and live a simpler, more Spartan lifestyle for a few years then you know you get that freedom level and then you can start accumulating the money and then you can start buying the toys with the income that your investments are producing that's my longer term philosophy yeah i like that so how did you get into the real estate you did mention that you first venture and you your 401k experience and your Roth and you dabbled in stocks but what 
put you down the rabbit hole of real estate and how did you maybe see how it might be superior? And I guess the real question is, did your brother eventually end up investing with you? Yeah, so he's he is not investing with me. He he has his own investments that he that he's purchased more on the single family side. And the thing about this space with passive investing, it's not for everybody. And that's something yeah. that I tell people up front. This is it's a great way once you reach a point in your life when you're ready to diversify. Maybe, you know, if you liked having the, all the control over an investment, you know, what I do with commercial real estate and syndication, bringing passive investors in, if you need to have the control, then this isn't for you. And that's okay. Yeah, yeah. But for me, when I ultimately, why I ultimately decided to invest passively at first in syndications, I learned, I bypassed the single family space altogether. I discovered bigger pockets, com and so much good information on there. I started listening to their podcast. They were bigger pockets. Forget how I happened upon it, but I just started going, learning about every different niche in real estate investing. And I noticed a theme. It seemed like everybody was ultimately ending, not everybody, a lot of people were ultimately ending up in the multifamily space. Once they reached a certain level of a certain amount of single families, it gets very difficult to manage all the different projects, all the different yeah. tenants. So why not just have it all under one roof? Plus there's additional benefits to multifamily. Once you hit five units or more, you can force appreciation. It's based on the value is based on how much income a property generates, the net operating income. So if you can find the right kind of property and lower the expenses, increase the income, then you can really drive up the value of the property in a pretty quick time period. So I love that aspect of it. And then the further down I go, I discover syndication and I discover through syndication, I can enjoy all these benefits. But why do people invest in real estate? They want the cash flow, they want the tax benefits, and they want the appreciation. Through syndication, through passive investing, I can get all of these benefits, but I don't have to do any of the work. And so I can invest with somebody who has been doing this for a lot longer than I have, and I can still enjoy all of these benefits while I'm still working my job. I ultimately wanted to, and I have ended up on the general partner side, but at first I wasn't ready to take that leap. I wanted to get some experience and I wanted, I was busy. I just had my first kid. I was working full time at the power plant. I was still in the army national guard doing part-time military stuff. And I just had a lot going on, but I still wanted to be involved. So I just got educated. I met people, I developed relationships with folks who were putting these deals together, started doing my homework on these folks and learning the business plans and yeah, ultimately pulled the trigger on a passive investment, put 50K into a 200 unit apartment building just outside of Dallas back in early 2020. And that was a crazy think, time to invest right as COVID was hitting. So it's been a roller coaster, but I'm very happy with the communications that we've been getting from the general partners and, you know, very happy overall with the decision. I think that has been cash flowing if it's managed decently. We actually at the same time deployed some capital in North Dallas and it's been going pretty well. We actually yeah. just... Yeah. yeah, likewise. Yeah, it's, it's been a crazy time. It's where you like counterintuitive while everybody's pulling back, we were expanding. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you did the same thing. So, you know, you're moving into the contraction and you're taking advantage of those opportunities. Yeah, my, I've always heard to not try to time the market. And it's been my philosophy ever since I've started investing different capacities is just to you adjust your strategy as the market changes, but don't stop. There's always yeah. good investments to be had. You're missing out if you're not investing. I think so too. I think if the business plan is sound and there is consideration about the depth and the leverage and it's in tune with the market scenario and the sentiment of the outlook. It's always time to. And if you're bet if you're investing with somebody who has the experience and has been through, I don't think anybody had been through anything like COVID-19. People who've been <laughs> in the market longer, they are going to have the experience to deal with these black swan events as they come up versus myself, who was a newbie in the space. And I'm definitely glad that I went that route as opposed to doing it myself at first. Yeah. And I think it, it helped to be in, invested in a business friendly state. It's one of the reasons you didn't do it in California and I didn't do it in New York. 100%. 
absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> because you and me would have been screwed. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. And another great thing about syndication, you can diversify all within commercial real estate as a broad spectrum of a number of different asset classes. But you can, as a passive investor, all you have to do is build relationships and understand the general concept of how these business plans are going to play out. Like you can invest with different operators, you can invest in different markets, different asset classes, and have a truly diversified passive portfolio of real estate all over the country with all different people. And that's one of my favorite aspects of this. Yeah. Yeah. This is one of the reasons we love multifamily real estate. So what are some of the things you are currently working on? Where are you trying to take it on a personal note to the next level? Yeah, so what I'm working on currently, my partner and I, who I developed a relationship with a guy, Daniel, we met in a multifamily coaching program and we hit it off. We really complimented each other's skill sets. And so we started working to take down our own deals. And throughout that process, we learned that this is an unfair space. And the folks with the strongest track records are going to get priority on the best deals most of the time if for somebody like us and our team a couple years ago we're brand new to the space and we're trying to get on these uh, these brokers lists and all these agents trying to get them to send us their deals and they were none of them were penciling out and so we realized that all these operators who are having the most success they have plenty of good deal flow i know because i'm receiving them as passive opportunities and yeah what really stuck out in our mind is that if we want to have a piece of this pie, don't try to beat them, but let's join them. So how can we solve a problem for them? So what these operators need is capital. So what myself and my partner, Daniel in Freedom Investor, what we're all about is trying to connect folks with passive investment opportunities. We're acting as the intermediary. We're trying to educate our networks and teach them about the benefits of investing in these commercial real estate deals and trying to connect those folks with the operators who have all these good deals. And so right yeah. now we're, we're in the process of putting together our investment vehicle, our fund, so we can do that and not have to participate on the, uh, the active side of it. Yeah, I actually think that's very aligned with my thesis in this. I feel like as long as you have access to capital and you can bring capital to the best operators, you always have access to the best operators in the best markets. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I feel like if people are focused on a particular market as an operator, to shift for them is harder than for shift to, for someone who is deploying capital. Yeah. So if you want to follow the best market trends, I think having access to capital really helps. Yeah, yeah, that's we, over the past few years, we've just developed so many strong relationships with there's so many amazing people in this space. They're not all quality operators, but you develop when you're in the space long enough, you learn who to invest with and who not to invest with. And you learn how to vet these folks out. So that's the value that we're trying to bring to our networks and help folks. We're trying to make it like passive investing for passive investors, so the next step of passive investing. So folks that have, they have their W-2 jobs, they have their businesses, they want nothing to do with owning a property or building relationships yeah. with operators. So we're trying to act as the middlemen between them having to even do that work and the operators. So are you trying to have a blind fund that's going out over a longer time horizon or are you going to make it project specific? So it's project specific, yeah. So we have a number of operators who we've built relationships with and we've already performed our due diligence. We have a, we have a process that, we're, that we undertake and we have a criteria for these operators. And so once we've done our due diligence on these operators and we're starting off in the multifamily space, that's what we know and what we love. But there's also other asset classes that we are big fans of, self-storage, mo mobile home parks, luxury RV camping resorts. So we're doing the homework on all of these different investment opportunities and the people who are putting the deals together. And then once they meet our criteria, then we start accepting deals for them and looking at the deals ourselves. And then through our fund, we can invest as a group into those deals. So yeah. it's a pretty neat concept. I think it's relatively new to the space and we're really excited about it. 
Yeah, I'm hearing more and more about mobile home parks. Actually, we just last week had Bryce on the podcast talking about mobile home parks because he loves them. And they have this natural decline in availability because nobody wants to give new space. Nobody wants to have a mobile home park in their backyard. Right. Yeah. And by no means am I an expert on mobile homes, but I've spoken with Bryce before and it makes a lot of sense, especially with the affordable housing crisis that we are experiencing right now. That's that is a vehicle, an investment vehicle that can solve a real pop problem in the U.S. right now. And I'm really excited about that space as well. It's actually interesting. We touched up on it last week, the kind of things that are coming up in order to solve the housing crisis from I mentioned it last week was 3D printing houses which right now is a permit issue, but they're actually capable of three printing single family houses. Man, that's crazy. Uh, yeah, I haven't yeah. heard about that. That's, it's there, amazing there, that we've come to that. To, to there's that a couple of pilot technology. projects going on where cities are willing to the, the permit process to see how that plays out because they do see that as a potential solution and they can actually print an entire house in a, in a matter of days. Yeah, stuff like that is amazing. There is a real problem that we're having, that we're facing in the U.S. We're between now and 2035 at this rate, we're going to be over 4 million housing units short of where we need to be. And not to mention the affordability of it all. Based on the median income of folks in the U.S. right now, they cannot, I think over 80 percent cannot afford the median mortgage, monthly mortgage payment. So it's, it is approaching crisis level and something has to be done. But again, that's also bad underwriting by the banks. If money comes cheap and easy, that's usually the next round of it is when people can't deliver on their debt, you know? Yeah, yeah. When this much money, what, 40% of the M2 money supply that's in circulation right now has been created in the past two years. Yeah, I don't see how that can end well. Yeah, the funds of fund structure. I'm actually, we're, we're, we're working in that space too. So I'm personally super excited about it. Who is uh, your syndication lawyer that you're working with? So we are working with, uh, it's a group called the Tonkin Group. They're out of, they're out of Seattle. So they are uh, through the platform that we're using. There's a, they're the in-house attorneys. So they're the ones who are helping us put all this together. And they have a, it's like a turnkey for lack of a better phrase uh, for helping to get all this stuff going they've done it before they have experience and yeah they're the group that we're using for that interesting you you mentioned platform is that a platform basically to like a crm and capital raising platform so it's avester it's called avester yeah. it's a customizable fund uh, badri and sanjay are the guys putting it together they're great they've been super helpful throughout the process and i really think this is going to change the way it's going to play a big part in the way that uh, people are investing their money over time this is really making it easy for folks to take their hard-earned money and invest it in commercial real estate getting their money off of wall street and into main street they spend enough time around the uh, real estate investing space you hear that all the time but i truly believe in it you can actually see you can go to the property where you invest your money if you want to you can see the business plan play out you can do it on a much deeper relationship level and so this this investment vehicle the the investor platform is really going to change the way that folks are investing yeah i would always like to emphasize on that too it's a tangible investment you're not in some basket with a bunch of companies that you could never do the due diligence on and for people that really want to know where their money sits and where it's working and where it's having an impact i think it's one of the best asset classes and that's honestly why I'm in this space, because when I started looking at stocks and eventually you get more into it, and even if you want to be more sophisticated and maybe you get into niche ETFs, you can never do the full due diligence on that. And that just left me in a space where it's like, I actually want to have more knowledge on where the impact is being generated and, and what is in those baskets. Yeah, absolutely. That was one of the things that I ultimately forced me or not forced me, but made me realize that I wanted to stop investing so much into my 401k. I have a company match, so I still do the company match. I'm not doing 20% anymore. My company match is 3%. So I do 3% and the rest is saving up to invest in real estate. Yes, yeah, it's, it's actually also really interesting how Wall Street cornered those direct pension options or even in Roth. It takes a different level of sophistication to get your money out of a traditional Roth. Yes, you can have a self-directed, but most people don't ever go to that step of education and sophistication and do the homework and 
then you tell them, oh, there is a fee to this. And they're like, oh, I don't want to pay fees. I don't pay fees at Charles Schwab. They're, you're taking control, but it looks like, I'm not sure how this original system was built, but it looks like Wall Street played it very well to keep it all tied and yeah, keep the money where we are managing it and we can make our money off your money. Totally. You hit the nail right on the head that once I found out, I didn't know. I just always heard you invest in your 401k or throw money in an IRA. And, you know, when you're 65, you're going to take it out and then retire. But I didn't realize that you can't just access that money <laughs> whenever you want to and use it. Yeah. And that really made me mad. I'm, like I had, you can, there's certain ways to do it, taking a loan out and then you have to pay it back with interest. I wanted to be able to use my money. So that's ultimately why I decided to stop contributing so much to those investment vehicles. And I wanted the control, which you don't really have in those other vehicles. Yeah, it's hard, harder to have a crest. But still, I think it's, it is a viable option for people that don't want to go too deep down the rabbit hole. But for people like you and me that make freedom their priority and not convenience, that's there, yeah, there's not, a different yeah. route to take. It's definitely like it did well for me. Just to be clear, like I did do very well. I was maxing the 401k out for at least five years and it built up a nice little nest egg there. But I'm here to tell everybody with a little bit of extra effort, with a little bit of education, read some books, stop binge watching TV, stop listening to, you know, nothing but music on your car rides to and from work. If you just put a little effort in and learn about this space, you can really increase the amount of returns you're getting on your money and increase the velocity of your money, meaning you can make your money work harder for you much more quickly than if you're just letting it sit in the stock market. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have any money in the stock market. It's got its place, but it shouldn't be 100% in the stock market, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. And I also agree with what you said. You just spend some of that net time on education I feel like if people would invest 30 minutes a day on average, you can tremendously change the trajectory of your personal finances and therefore of your entire family. Yes, absolutely. It, it, a lot of time. Yeah. And it's incredible that it's literally in, in most societies, it's more or less the same amount of folks out of 100 that are financially educated and live life on their terms. In every society, no matter where you go, you have some that are financially literate and you have a vast majority that isn't. And it's, it always blows my mind. Yeah, and it does take some effort. I think just in general, the way that we are brought up and what the majority of people are doing, you go in through a traditional education system and you're, it's just expected that you're going to, at least in my world it was, that I was going to go to college, that I was going to get a degree and that I was going to go get a job somewhere working for somebody else and invest into a retirement account. And then throughout that process, there's all of these kind of stereotypes along the way where you know if you feel like if you're in a certain job position you need to dress a certain way you need to wear a certain type of watch drive a certain type of car live in a certain type of neighborhood when really none of that matters nobody cares maybe some people do but if they care about that kind of stuff versus the person that you actually are and the goals that you have and the, what you're working towards if that stuff's more important they don't deserve a place in your friendship network or in your network in general it's all about just discovering what's more important to you in my opinion and the point that i came to and ultimately living a life where i can spend more time with my three beautiful kids and my wife and do live the life that we want to live by the time that my oldest is 10 years old and we can travel and do all those great things. That's more important to me than driving the coolest car, or having the coolest watch, yeah. living in the coolest neighborhood. All that kind of stuff really resonates with me. But that also takes quite some self-reflection. That's something that you must have been realizing for yourself and asking yourself those questions. Do, do you recall a particular moment in your life where you started thinking like that? There was never, there was not one particular moment, but more just over time, just continuing to learn and read. And I'm a big fan of Jim Rohn. He is yeah. he's Tony Robbins mentor. He's yeah. amazing. He passed away before I even discovered him. But I listened to this one audio book that he has. I've probably listened to it 
I've probably spent a thousand plus hours listening to that thing just on my drive to and from work. Probably even more like three to five thousand hours. I've just listened to that thing so much. But long drive. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I've been I've been listening to it for years, and I just every couple of weeks I just listen to it over the course of a week. He's all about reflection and figuring out what's the most important to you, and becoming realizing what it is that you want in life, and becoming the type of person who deserves to have that kind of life. And so for me, it's been an all around transformation with who I am as a person and being a person who provides value to others in the market, becoming a person who people would want to do business with, becoming a person who deserves to live the lifestyle that I want to live because the market doesn't lie. If you're not that type of person, then you're not going to have anybody that wants to work with you. So you need to, you need to be living your life in a way that is going to attract others to you and that's that was a huge eye opener for me just that concept in general so yeah just just reading and meeting other people along the way who are living the lifestyle that I want to live it's all been part of the process and getting out and networking nothing bad can happen out of that you meet some great people you meet some terrible people you meet some people who you know you're going to learn from each encounter that you're part of and I've definitely taken a lot away from all the networking that I've done and the folks that I've met. Yeah. So what are some of the biggest things you had to overcome in order to become the person that can attract the life that you wanted to have? I think you hear it a lot. And it's to the me, it's to me, it's gotten to the point where it sounds cliche, but limiting beliefs, like that's a real thing. And it is initially when you get into the space, other folks who are living the lifestyle that you want to live and it's hard to imagine yourself in that position. So for me, it was just a constant effort to push past that, to just not compare myself to others and realize that everybody had to start somewhere. And, you know, that person you see who's got $50,000 a month of passive income from his real estate investments, well, he started out with no dollars a month of passive income. So you got to start somewhere. And yeah. that's another huge part of that is just getting out and meeting people because you get to these conferences and meetups and I don't know what it is, but people in the real estate investing space are so generous with their knowledge. They just want to share and they just want everybody to succeed together in my experience. And yeah. you know, I realize that these folks who are having a lot of success, they're very down to earth most of the time. They, uh, they're happy to share with you and they're not superhumans. A lot of them didn't come from money. They've just been disciplined and constantly worked on improving themselves and eventually good things start to happen. What you just said is one of the, the things that really attracted me because I saw some people having tremendous success and I was like, wait, if you can do it, I can do it. You know, that that's, I can see that you're not superhuman. Sometimes maybe when I look at Elon Musk or people who are like real brain giants, like geniuses, and I'm like, I know I'm not going to build Microsoft. Maybe this is just my limiting. There's many of the multimillionaires in the industry who've helped do tremendous transactions in the multifamily space. And I'm like, I can do that if you can do that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that it's good to have a little bit of a competitive edge. And I've, I've experienced that time and time again throughout my life where, you know, whatever it was, whether it was in college or sporting events or the, once you immerse yourself in a group of people and you learn, you start to learn about folks, I'm not saying that these people aren't great people, but you start to think, hey, if you can do it, I can do it too. Like why you and not me? So yeah, I fully agree with that. But it's also, it goes back all the way to the four minute mind. The limiting belief that people would die if they try to run that fast and your body could literally not do it. But the minute it was broken down, just weeks after, multiple people broke it. It's really like for many of us, unfortunately, and most people that I speak to even on the podcast say that it helps them to see other people doing it. And I'm one of them. I did have a few, very few guess and they were like i don't care what other people are doing i know i can take it to an, another level and uh, and i'm very that really is like a completely different mindset where they're like no no nobody ever had to tell me i'm able to do this i knew it and i'm like wow that's also very empowering to to have that sense of certainty because i know there's a lot no a lot more inside of myself but for whatever reason it is i'm seeking comfort in seeing other people 
that have done it already. Yeah, no, totally. And those people, I think, definitely exist. I, I'm not one of them. I wish I was. But I think it's just over time, you develop a level of confidence in yourself. And that's where I think it's important to when you make a promise to yourself, when you tell yourself you're going to do something, you need to keep that promise. You know, it's, yeah. it's very important that you develop that track record with yourself. Because I've had so many years where you know, whether it was in the classroom, I was a terrible student in school. I just, I didn't care. And I felt like it d didn't apply to what I was doing, but it had a, a strong negative impact on me psychologically. It, it gave me a lack of confidence in myself. And then ultimately over time, I had to rebuild that confidence. And what it ultimately comes down to is keeping the promises to yourself that you make. And, and another side of that is when you do surround yourself with others who are doing it, they can hold you accountable for the promises that you make. And accountability partners are great for all of that. Having somebody that you're going through the process with, just when you're in a group, I think it's much easier to succeed when the group is working together to succeed or holding each other accountable. But yeah, those folks definitely exist. <laughs> That there's zero doubts in their mind, but for the rest of us, for me, you gotta you gotta work towards it and push through that comfort zone and continuously just work on growing and taking it to the next level. Yeah, one hundred percent. And it's there; it's definitely there. Those limiting belief, and all of us carry them. But I think one of the things, and I feel like I'm sharing like a new realization. Maybe I had in the last ten days or so. I, I can clearly detect now for myself when I'm coming from a space of fear or when I'm operating out of a place of growth. And it really helped me to distinct the state in order to make better decisions. Because if it comes out of that state, I'll just ignore it because the fearful one will never get us anywhere. So I'm like, I'm trying to keep myself in the state where I make leaps forward. And that's yeah. been my latest breakthrough on that one. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's all about you know, that. That reminds me of just getting out of your comfort zone. And, you know, if you're operating in your comfort zone for too long, you're never going to grow. And I would recommend folks to try to find some way to get out of their comfort zone every day, whatever that looks like. That's going to be different for each of us individually. Ultimately, that zone just outside of your comfort zone becomes your new comfort zone once you get there and you start operating, you start meeting people. And life should just be a continuous continuous cycle of making that area just outside of your comfort zone your new comfort zone yeah so what is the next level on your comfort zone what are you currently working towards what are you breaking down in terms of limiting beliefs what are you sharing yeah, so, so for us it's it's we're at, we've been my partner and i decided to officially join forces and create freedom investor uh, a few months back, and we we were we had just done our first deal as GPs at the end of 2021, and then we decided to form our official entity and create Freedom Investors. So much time has been spent, way more time than I thought, just doing behind the scenes work and getting our new business officially set up so we can start deploying capital into these commercial real estate syndications. So now what we're doing is just getting out there, pounding the pavement and spreading the word. And we're trying to bring some investors into some deals. So there's so many amazing deals are currently happening and felt that without our vehicle set up, whether that was the right move or not, we were just waiting until our entity was official. And there were all these little hangups and, but now we're very close to the finish line. And you know, by the time this thing goes live, this podcast will be there. So now we're just pounding the pavement. We're trying to get out to events, spread the word about commercial real estate investing and the ability to do it from in a passive nature. So that's as far as limiting beliefs, it's more so just getting out of my comfort zone. I know what I need to do. I just need to execute at this point. So it's, it's been a fun ride and it's, I'm looking forward to getting uncomfortable a little more and getting out in front of people and spreading the good word about commercial real estate. Yeah. Yeah. It seems that the true reward in life comes from staying in that space where we're just slightly uncomfortable and pushing the boundaries of our overall comfort zone. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. And then it's, I think it's Dean Crusius. He always says the worst thing that could happen to him is when he meets the creator and he's here, this is the man or Ed Milet also says that, that, that this is the man you could have been. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. That's a scary thought. 
And I don't know what it was, but more so recently, life is short. Like, why spend it doing something that you don't enjoy and working to build somebody else's dream? Why not? Why not spend it building your own dream? So that's my thought process. Whose dream is it to build a power plant? It's public service. No? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's, it's, I'm thankful for the job. And I never grew up just wishing that I, yeah, I could help secure a nuclear power plant. That was, that was never my dream. Don't get me wrong. I am truly. Wasn't that your childhood job, dream when your dad gave you that legal power plant? I don't think that I've ever seen a nuclear legal power plant, but you get the idea. <laughs> Yeah, totally. And I don't want to give everybody the wrong impression. I'm truly thankful for my job. It has changed my life and I work with a bunch of amazing people. But due to the fate of the power plant, even though it's been extended for a few years, you know, other things are calling and I need to find a way to provide for my family. And instead of going and getting an MBA and getting another job somewhere, I'm just trying to, I'm making a bet on myself and going for that life of freedom and control. I love it. John, one of my favorite questions at the very end is always to wrap it up is what does it mean to you to have a life well lived? To me, a life well lived is you have the ability to do the things that bring you joy with the people who you love the most. And it's a constant exploration for me. Right now, it's so hard to envision what life would be like after a W-2 job. But I know that 10 years from now, I want to be able to attend all of my children's events, whatever that may look like, whether it's sporting events, school recitals, dance, whatever. And I want to have a lifestyle where I can do, we can travel the world for long extended periods of time, not just having to take the standard two weeks of vacation from my W-2 job. I want to have control. I want to spend time with my family. And ultimately, I want to find a way to give back to the community and help other folks live that lifestyle. Yeah, I love it. John, thank you so much for your time. Where can people find out more about you and Freedom Investor and can connect with you and your opportunities? Yeah, thank you. The best place to go is to www.passivecreprofits.com. There you'll find a place where you can sign up for our free guide. It tells you everything you need to know about what a process what the process of investing passively in a commercial real estate deal looks like. You'll also find our LinkedIn links, the ability to schedule a call with us if you're interested in learning more, and a link to our podcast, Freedom Investor Radio. So that's the best place to go. That's free as in commercial real estate, PassiveCREprofits.com. Awesome. Perfect. Everybody, make sure to connect with us. Thank you for joining us at The Path to Wealth. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Check out our upcoming guests and be sure to share it with all your friends and family that want to take their life to the next level of wealth. Thank you for listening to Freedom Investor Radio. If you like what you heard, make sure to rate, review, subscribe, and share with a friend. Thanks again for listening.